welcome everybody. Welcome, welcome. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Philippa Mason and I am the Scottish Development Manager at Glaucoma UK. I'm delighted uh, also to wel welcome our speaker today, Professor David Crabb. Um, David is Professor of Statistics and Vision Research at City University in London and Glaucoma UK are delighted that he's joining us today to deliver a talk titled um, How Does Glaucoma Look and What Kate Moss Got to Do With It? Um, sounds very intriguing and I'm looking forward to uh, finding out what that's all about. Um, David's research laboratory, or the Crab Lab as it's known, uh, contains a mixture of vision scientists, ophthalmologists, psychologists, mathematicians and computer scientists. The research lab focuses on measurement in vision, visual fields, imaging, visual function, quality of life and medical statistics. One of the main themes of his work in glaucoma is relating the different stages in the disease process to patients' visual disability. So just a wee bit about who Glaucoma UK are. Glaucoma UK is the UK's charity for people with glaucoma, and we work in three main areas to prevent glaucoma sight loss. Firstly, we campaign to raise awareness of the disease. We want people to know what glaucoma is and the, about the importance of getting your eyes tested. We know that the earlier you get diagnosed, the less likely you are to experience sight loss. Secondly, we, pro we provide support and advice to people with glaucoma and also for those who care for them. We have information leaflets, a helpline, a buddy service and a patient forum. And we also provide training and advice to professionals looking after people with glaucoma. All of our services are free to access. Finally, we fund research into the diagnosis, treatment, care and prevention of glaucoma. We don't have a huge amount of money, we're not a massive charity, but we like to be able to, um, to, to put money into research and particularly kind of putting money into initial funding for kind of seed research and early stage research, which really helps the, big, the projects kind of get bigger and get going. Okay, I think that's probably all I'm going to say today. Uh, and I'm going to welcome David to uh, share his screen and start our talk for today. Thank you, David. To the front. Well, first of all, thank you for that really uh, nice introduction, uh, Philippa. And also, um, just to echo uh, what I know about <clears throat> UK glaucoma, and that is, you know, how helpful an organisation uh, they are. Okay, can you, you can see my title slide um, fine, yeah? Yeah, we can see your title slide. I can hear Great. you perfectly, David. Cheers. Brilliant. Thanks. So, yeah, thank you very much for that uh, very nice introduction. And also, thank you uh, for inviting me to uh, present this afternoon and, and welcome everybody who've, uh, who've tuned in, uh, as it were. And, uh, yeah, the title is a bit intriguing. How does glaucoma look and what's Kate Moss got to do with it? Um, uh, so, as Philippa uh, explained, uh, I'm from... City University London, and um, I work in a school of optometry. So many of you who are patients and are listening, uh, you probably would have had your glaucoma first diagnosed or um, become a glaucoma suspect uh, through a visit to your community optometrist. And um, my university or the school in which I work uh, trains those optometrists. So it's not a medical school, um, but we train these optometrists to a pretty high level, really. They do four years of training with us, and we teach around about 100 of these um, every year. So that keeps us uh, uh, very busy. And the university has a very long tradition of teaching optometry or ophthalmic optics. And um, we are one of the oldest um, optometry schools, uh, certainly in the UK and in Europe. And uh, there's some pictures there of um, some of our students from the 1920s and 1930s, I believe. And the one thing I would say is they look a lot smarter in that picture than our current uh, students. We also try to do research as well. And that's what I'm going to try and um, tell you a little bit about this afternoon. And my research lab is interested in uh, measurement techniques and vision. So any of the kind of measurements, any of the kind of um, investigations that you have at the optometrist or any of the tests that you do at the hospital, we're interested in those kinds of measurements and those kinds of tests. And as Philippa nicely explained, um, 
I, I'm a bit strange in background. Uh, I, I'm a kind of a mathematician, and yet I work in a school of optometry. And this is sort of uh, reflective of my little research group. We're quite a mixture of people. So there are clinicians, there are optometrists and ophthalmologists. And um, uh, we also have computer scientists, biomedical engineers and psychologists. So that means that we're interested in a, a variety of different things. So one particular topic is we're interested in all of these um, kind of cameras that are used to look at the back of the eye. So some of you or many of you would have had these assessments where, um, where someone's trying to take a picture of the back of the eye. Something called optical coherence tomography is something we're particularly interested in. And um, what we do in my lab is develop ways in which these imaging devices can work and also provide the, the ophthalm ophthalmologist, the doctor, the clinician uh, with the uh, software tools that will allow them to uh, interpret those uh, images. Something else we are interested in, and I'll be speaking a little bit about, is we actually go into hospitals and pull out large um, amounts of data to see what's going on in hospitals, how well patients are being looked after in retina clinics and glaucoma clinics. And I have a long-standing interest in um, measuring what we call visual function. In other words, what you can see. And in particular, you know, I'm uh, particularly interested in this um, instrument. Let me see if I can get the, a little uh, cursor here. Uh, I'm, I'm particularly interested in this instrument that many of you have experience in, uh, which is sometimes known as the fields machine or the visual field assessment or perimetry. So that's something I'm, I'm particularly uh, interested in. And we're actually developing some portable perimetry at the moment with this idea that eventually it might be possible that we can assess patients' vision and their visual field in the comfort of their own homes so that the, you know, this would be like an alternative to this visual field test that I'm sure many of you have experienced. Now, when it comes to this um, uh, uh, visual field test, which as I say, many of you have actually experienced and many of you have, uh, have tested. I'd like to start off by saying this afternoon, I, I think it's the most important assessment in glaucoma. And the reason I, I say it's the most important assessment in glaucoma is it gives us an idea about what a patient can actually see. It tells us something about what we call the visual function. Now, at the same time, you all know that, you know, the other important measurement that we take when we're looking after people with glaucoma is the measurement of their intraocular pressure. In fact, the, the ophthalmologist, the doctor who looks after you as a patient um, is probably obsessed about intraocular pressure. But that obsession is a healthy obsession because after all, intraocular pressure is the thing that the doctor, the ophthalmologist, the clinician can modify. You know, we, we can treat the intraocular pressure and that's what glaucoma is all about. But even though there's an obsession about measuring that, and we've got to make sure the intraocular pressure is under control, um, the first point that I'd like to make this afternoon is I think this other assessment that you do when you go to the clinic, uh, the visual field test, the perimetry test, is the most important test. Now, you might turn around to me and say, well, well, actually, yeah, you're, you're bound to say that because that's your research interest, and that, that's right. You know, We've done lots of work over the years to try to make this test easier, We've made things to improve the design and how to analyze the results from it. And a lot of those things are actually used in clinics. So it's quite nice as a researcher when you develop something and it's actually used in the hospital. But what do the real experts think about this uh, visual field test? So what about the real experts? Well, we decided that the real experts are probably people like you who are listening this afternoon. And that is the patients. So we did this little study that we published in this um, um, paper uh, a few years ago where we actually brought patients together and um, in like a focus group really in a series of interviews and asked them about what they were um, what they thought of um, of uh, the way in which their glaucoma was monitored in clinics what did they think of their hospital visits you know what did they like what did they dislike now I think many of you won't be surprised that many of our patients said, oh, you know, the visual field test was it's difficult. It causes me anxiety. Um, you know, I find it hard to do. It's difficult to concentrate. So many of the, the patients talked about the difficulty with doing this visual field examination, as we call it. And yet many patients were quite positive. And the ones that were positive 
kind of explained uh, the aspects to the assessment that uh, made it a good experience. And I think these are important points um, to make. And, uh, and that is that the patients that said that there was a positive experience about doing visual pill testing were often the ones that were well supervised, that had good instructions. Um, some patients talked about um, how important it was to be uh, doing this assessment in a kind of a quiet environment, a well-organized environment. They talked about the, uh, the sort of choreography of the visual field test and how important that was. And the other thing that um, uh, patients sort of talked about was sometimes the fact that they don't get a chance to look at their results. And um, this sort of struck me as something quite important really, because uh, we talk about um, this visual field test as an examination, an examination of your eyes. And in any kind of examination, we want to have some kind of results at the end. So, uh, you know, having an understanding about the results is quite important. So maybe at the end of this little session this afternoon, you will have a little bit more of an understanding about what the visual field results are. And I would encourage you, certainly the patients who are the participants in this webinar this afternoon to, to find out more about your visual field test result. And if, and if your doctor or your clinician or your healthcare professional isn't showing you your visual field chart, then maybe it would be a good idea to, to have a look at it. So that's the first point I want to make. And then the research I'm going to talk about this afternoon, uh, you'll be pleased to know, isn't just about the visual fields, but it's about what patients can and cannot do when they have um, a condition like glaucoma. So we've done a, a lot of studies in recent years where we've tried to relate the measurements that we take in the clinic to what people can actually do or can't do because of their um, uh, vision loss. So for example, we're very much interested uh, in what patients can do in terms of their everyday uh, tasks. You know, it might be simply finding um, something on a supermarket shelf. It might be making a cup of coffee in the kitchen at home. We're also interested in relating the measurements that we take in the clinic to other aspects of people's lives. You know, when, when does a visual field loss start to affect people's mobility? You know, when does their vision start to deteriorate such that it affects their mobility? And something I know that patients are particularly interested in is, you know, when does their visual field uh, start to impact on their safety in driving? And so these are some of the things that we've been looking at um, quite a bit, um, Philippa, in the last sort of uh, 10 years or so. So I'm going to share some of the results from those, those studies, which I think are interesting. Coming back to this visual field chart, the, the one thing that, uh, a couple of things that I want to say is that uh, your ophthalmologist or the clinician often kind of associates a number with the visual field chart. And, and that tells us how bad the visual field is. So in other words, we, we spend a lot of time trying to quantify or to try to um, weigh up how bad the visual field is. And um, if you look at these uh, seven visual field charts here, these are all from different people. They are seven different eyes from seven different people. And if we take the kind of standard number that we use for um, measuring uh, these visual fields, then they all have the same kind of value. In other words, if we just look at the number that's associated with these visual fields on how bad they are, we would say that they're all about the same. And yet the, the, the point that I'm sort of probably clumsily making here is if you look at these visual field charts, you can see that these black areas, you know, what we call scotoma, the missing parts of your vision, are all in different locations. They're in different spaces. And this is a quite an important point. You know, it's not so much how bad your visual field is or where the problem is in your visual field. It's actually the location of the visual field that makes a big um, difference. So that's one thing. And then the other thing that I'd, I'd like to encourage you to think about um, for those of you who are patients is that when you're a patient, I think what happens is you go and see your, um, your eye doctor, your ophthalmologist and your optometrist and you say good morning to them. And yet I suspect that when you say good morning or good afternoon to them, your ophthalmologist looks back at you and, and he sees something like this. In other words, what I'm kind of saying here is that often all the assessments that we do in the clinic or the way we treat vision is always about one eye at a time. So a lot of the assessments that you do, so for example, in a visual field test, you know, it'd be very unusual for you to actually do a visual field test with both eyes open. 
And so this is quite important because the way in which you function with your vision is obviously with both eyes. Now, without going into too much detail, we've, um, we've, been, we've done quite a bit of work in this area and uh, it allows us to kind of generate an idea about what a patient can actually see you know, with both of their eyes. And it's something called the integrated visual field. And without going into too much um, detail about this, I'd just like you to look at these, um, these visual field charts. So these are from three different people. So these are three different patients and I'm showing their left and right visual fields. And if you didn't know anything about these, um, these patients or these visual fields, you'd look at them and say, well, you know that these dark areas represent the scotoma or the blind areas or the missing parts in the patient's visual fields. And you would think that all of these three people would have kind of pretty poor vision. As it turns out, nearly all of them are asymptomatic. Um, and asymptomatic is just a posh word for saying they really don't notice these kind of scotomas or these visual field defects in their vision. And the reason is, is when you construct the binocular visual field, the kind of um, uh, bad areas that overlap in the left and right eye kind of um, compensate for each other. So in other words, let me put that in a better way. It, you know, your, your, your vision, your better vision in one eye compensates for the poorer vision in the other eye. So this is something that's quite important and something that we, we know is very true of glaucoma. And that is that you can lose lots of vision in just one single eye and still not really notice it in terms of your everyday visual function. So those are two sort of important things. One, you know, where your visual field defect is in your vision. Is it up here or is it down here? And also this idea that both eyes work together. And as I say, we've, we've been doing lots of studies in this area where we've tried to relate these measurements, these visual field measurements that we take in the clinic to what patients can and cannot do. And I just want to um, sort of share with you this afternoon some examples of some of those studies, because one way you could do this is you could directly ask the person. You could directly ask them, you know, do you have difficulties with reading? Do you have problems finding on something on a supermarket shelf? And instead of asking them questions, instead of doing that, what we do is we bring patients into the university and actually measure their performance on doing some of these tasks. Now, I've probably not explained that very well, and it's, it's much better uh, if it's explained with an example. So this is an example of one of these kind of studies that we did in the university. And this was a way of, of assessing how good patients were with glaucoma compared to kind of people with normal vision with this very sort of simple everyday task of reaching and grasping for an object. And what we do in the uh, research lab is we get our participant to sit at this table and you see you've got these kind of um, uh, cameras that sit above the table and on the hands and wrists we put these small markers and this allows this camera set up to uh, follow the actions of the hand and arm. And then our participants sit at the desk with these rather sort of futuristic looking goggles and these goggles clear, we put an object in front of them and they simply reach and grasp for the object. Now, by doing this, we can actually measure very, very carefully whether someone's uh, ability to just do this everyday task, which the scientists call prehension, it's a very kind of complicated uh, mobility uh, kind of um, uh, move really, you know, actually just reaching and grasping and picking something up, you know, it really seems very, uh, easy and very uh, kind of trivial and very natural, but it's very much guided by your vision. And um, what we found when we did these experiments is that patients were, were much more slower in general and much more variable. In other words, you get two patients with kind of very similar visual field loss and one seems to be less affected than another. Something else that we found in this particular study, which I thought would be interesting to share with you, is that the patient's visual field defect or this visual field scotoma, the location of it was very important uh, when it came to the, to the ability of the person to do the task correctly. In other words, people with visual field loss in what we call the inferior visual field, and that's just a posh way of sort of saying, well, this is visual field loss down here and superior visual field loss is stuff up here. With people with inferior visual field loss, they found this task much more difficult. 
Now, once again, many of you might be sitting there thinking, well, good grief, you know, there's a there's a scientist spending all this time telling telling me which something which is pretty obvious, really, because if I'm if I'm looking down at the table to pick up like a, a glass uh, of water, then obviously the vision that I have down here is more important than the vision up here. But once again, you know, in the clinic, we might consider these two patients that you see here to have very equivalent vision. But in fact, it's quite different because of the location of that defect. Something else that we know that patients are particularly um, um, sort of concerned about is driving. Uh, we did this study a few years ago, and it was interesting. This was based on some interviews with patients. And lots of patients talked about um, their fear of losing their driving license. Their worry about losing their driving license was probably a bigger fear to them than losing their vision completely. In other words, they kind of understood enough about glaucoma uh, and understood enough about their treatment to recognize that, you know, that they weren't going to lose vision completely in their lifetime, but they were concerned that their vision would deteriorate such that they could no longer drive. So, you know, this, this kind of underlines the importance of, um, of driving and the importance of driving to an individual. And we've done lots of studies in vision and driving over the years, and I, I don't want to bore you with all of them this afternoon, but I thought I'd show you one. And this was something where we used something called the hazards uh, perception test. Now, if you say a hazard perception test to young people, uh, and I'm not sure how many young people we've got in this afternoon, but if you said hazard perception test to young people, they know that this is part of the UK driving license test now. So an old person like me, when I did my driving test, you just had a few questions from the highway code that you had to answer at the end of the test. And that was your kind of theory assessment. Nowadays, the assessment of what people know about driving when they're learning to drive is much more strict and is much more detailed. And part of that assessment is this thing called the hazards perception test. And the idea here is that you watch a series of videos and these videos are shot from the perspective of a driver. So these are, are actually shot point of view from um, um, of, of everyday road scenes as though you were driving on the road. And in these kind of little videos, um, little hazards are kind of staged. So these are actually staged hazards that occur. And the idea is you do this test and when you see this hazard, a car might be pulling out or a pedestrian might be uh, crossing the road, then you have to press a button and the way the hazard perception test works is that it um, kind of calculates your reaction time. In other words, it's a way of educating people who are uh, novice drivers, educating them about the dangers and the hazards when driving. Now, we thought it would be really uh, good to show these kinds of videos to people with glaucoma, people with visual field loss, and compare their performance to uh, people with the same age who had you know, no vision problems. And when we did this, we also, um, when we asked them to do this hazard perception test, we had this other kind of sort of quite clever setup where we actually followed the person's eyes when they were doing the test. So in other words, if you did this um, uh, test in my lab, you could do the hazard perception test. And then we had like a very kind of sophisticated camera setup that actually follows where you're looking on the screen. Now, from a research point of view, this was kind of quite interesting because for the first time, what we showed is that many patients with visual field loss um, actually moved their eyes very differently to people without visual field loss. So that was the kind of science part of it that was really interesting. But the actual videos of people's performance is, is more revealing. And I, I thought they would be interesting to show you this afternoon. Now, when I show this video, you'll see these dots on the screen. Um, the red dots on the screen represent where people with normal vision are looking. So these are the people with healthy vision. And then you've got this blue dot in the center, which represents the point of regard or the gaze of the person uh, with visual field loss. And when the film uh, runs and um, it kind of loops um, or repeats itself, so you'll be able to see it again. You'll see on the side here, you've got this kind of um, uh, pedestrian who's about to cross the road with a with a pram there. And as you watch it again, you'll notice that the red dots kind of all move across to the hazard and see the, see the pedestrian. But maybe this time, keep your eye on the blue dot 
And this represents the, the, the person with visual field loss. And at no stage does she kind of move her eyes to the, uh, the hazard. This is the same situation, same person. See if you can see the, uh, the hazard on this film uh, that's occurring. So you've got this car that's coming in at the junction at the right. So it's a pretty obvious kind of hazard that if you was looking at the uh, road ahead, you would see. And as you watch it again here, notice that the, the red dots all swarm across and, and see the hazard. But the blue dot, which represents the point of regard or the fixation point or where the, the patient with glaucoma is looking, she never moves her eyes from the car in front. So this is the patient's visual fields and this is their binocular visual field down here. And what we suspect is that their visual field defect is actually masking or covering up where that hazard is in the film. So she never really sees the pedestrian. And so therefore she never moves her eye to, to that um, uh, pedestrian. Similarly, in the second sequence of the film, um, you know, we, we suspect that she doesn't see the car at that junction. Now, the patients who are listening to this webinar and the clinicians who might be listening as well know that people with glaucoma don't see these black areas like this. And this is something I'm going to come back to in a moment, but this was just a way of sort of kind of representing why we think the patients found to see the hazards. I'll just show you one more of these films because this was quite interesting because this blue dot here represents another patient. This is a different patient. And this patient is really scanning the road to try and see the hazard. You know, he's even looking around the trees there in order to try to predict or, or see where the car is. And if you watch the film uh, once again, you'll notice that in his attempt to try and scan the, the road scene, he actually fails to see the car uh, as it pulls out in front of him. So this is an example of a patient that's really moving their eyes, really scanning the environment in order to try to to find the, um, the hazard, but fails to do so. And this is a patient with pretty advanced visual field loss. They've got quite a restricted visual field and they certainly wouldn't be sort of legally fit to drive, but it was interesting that the patient was still using their preserved vision in order to try to find uh, the hazard. And once again, by superimposing the visual field chart onto the film, we kind of get an idea about why the patient um, struggles to see the hazard as it emerges. Um, something else that we know patients talk about in a similar vein is the difficulty they have when they're trying to find objects, when they're searching for objects. So again, we did a very similar experiment, which I won't go into too much detail about, where we asked people to actually look at pictures on a computer monitor and actually find objects within those uh, uh, pictures. And once again, we found that on average, people with glaucoma struggled with this task but once again, what was interesting, and you've got this really kind of large, stupid graph over here that I've shown you. What was interesting is that some patients, um, two patients with the same kind of visual field loss, one patient would do very well at the task and one would do poorly at the task. So again, um, this kind of um, uh, reinforces this idea about how people move their eyes and how they gaze around in scenes kind of improves their ability to, to do search, for example. And, um, you know, here's an example again of where we um, uh, had this set up where we could monitor patients' eye movements as they try to find these objects in these, uh, in these particular scenes. Something that we know patients also complain about or have problems with when they have visual field loss is, is, um, is reading. We know in glaucoma, your central vision, the vision that you use for reading, is only affected in the sort of later stages of the condition. And yet patients do talk about problems that they have with reading. And this was a, a nice piece of work done by Robin Burton in my lab. And it was a series of studies that actually showed the importance of the contrast of the letters. It also talked about the importance of lighting when someone is reading and also talked about the and also looked at how um, some patients get very tired after they read for a period of time. And a lot of that, again, is related to the way in which patients move their eyes in order to kind of compensate for this vision loss that they may have. So again, th these were kind of interesting and informative studies that tell, told us more about the kind of subtle problems that people with, um, with glaucoma and visual field loss have with, uh, with reading. 
And then there was a, a bit more research that I wanted to sort of share with you. And that is this idea about, you know, the impact of diagnosis when you're told that you have glaucoma. Um, we've done a series of studies that have sort of highlighted that, you know, when you actually get the diagnosis of glaucoma, when you're told that you have glaucoma and you have this chronic condition, that that in itself kind of impacts on your kind of quality of life, really. And uh, this was a, you know, this is a, a, um, a research paper that's actually written by a patient, which is really nice. You know, this is much better than a scientist or, or a doctor or a clinician. And this patient talked about the impact that, um, that when she was told that she had glaucoma, how difficult it was. And I think a lot of this is actually related to the way in which um, uh, people with glaucoma um, treat their condition as well. So we talk a lot about adherence and compliance to treatment you know, how often, how frequently people take their drops. And a lot of it is related to their kind of um, psychology and how they perceive that they have glaucoma. And I just wanted to share this story with you because this, this story really resonated with me. So as part of this study, which was done by Fiona Glenn in my lab, um, part of this study is that we interviewed patients. And I thought this was a really interesting story. This lady here, you know, she said that when she got her diagnosis, when she went to the ophthalmologist, and she was told that, you know, she's got this condition that's going to possibly, you know, mean that she's going to lose her vision in her lifetime, that, you know, she was really very, very scared. And that night, you know, that she was so convinced that, you know, she was going to lose her vision almost straight away that she decided to leave her bedroom door uh, open. You know, she normally closed her bedroom door. But on that night, she thought, I'm going to leave the door open so that when I wake up in the morning, even if I've lost my vision, I'll be able to find my way out the bedroom. Which, I, you know, for me, uh, uh, who's not a patient and not a clinician, this story really sort of resonated with me. At the same time, at the other end of the spectrum, and hopefully this is the kind of view of many of the, the patients that have joined us this afternoon, or many of the people who have got glaucoma or, uh, or are families of people with glaucoma who have joined us this afternoon, is that actually, once you get your head around glaucoma, it isn't really something to worry about so much. So this is an actual quote from someone who says, you know, don't worry about it, no problem. You know, have I got any worries about losing my vision? Well, no. And I think what we try to show in this research is this big difference between the patient who first gets their diagnosis, compare that to the person who, you know, has had their diagnosis for two or three years and has realized that once their uh, condition is being treated and, you know, they're under care of, a, of an ophthalmologist and their vision is being monitored and their intraocular pressure is being monitored, how more confident they feel that they're not going to lose vision in their um, lifetime. And then, um, then the other question I posed in uh, this talk was, you know, what does glaucoma look like? Now, this audience that I'm speaking to here know, um, you know, a little bit about what um, glaucoma looks like. But if you put um, glaucoma as a search term uh, in the internet, then you always get these kind of pictures that um, this is what people with glaucoma see of the world. And we have this rather kind of stupid idea that if you've got glaucoma, you know, you're walking around inside like a black tunnel or even worse, you know, you've got these black patches in your field of view. And this is not, not the case. And, and, you know, many of the audience this afternoon realize this because the perception of your vision loss in glaucoma is very complex. As I said earlier, the two eyes work together. So you may lose lots of vision in one eye, but then the other eye will compensate for that. And also, you have to kind of remember that, um, uh, you know, your seeing part of your visual system, the eyes, is only part of the visual system. In other words, that's kind of a, a complex way of me saying that the brain does most of the seeing. You know, the, the visual system is mainly done, uh, is mainly driven by the brain. So in other words, your visual system is very good at kind of filling in the gaps in your vision. So if you've got a bit of your vision that's missing, then this whole visual system is very good at masking where that uh, missing uh, vision is. So you might think, well, why is this important? Why should we worry that, um, that glaucoma is often depicted in this, uh, in this way? Well, I think it's wrong because of two reasons, because this audience is probably very aware that glaucoma in its early stages is asymptomatic. You don't have any symptoms. And if we're trying to raise awareness, and this is something that Glaucoma UK does very well, if we're trying to raise awareness for this condition, uh, when with these kind of pictures, we're almost saying, well, this is not a condition that's asymptomatic. In other words, you know, you know, 
by by describing glaucoma as, as having kind of black missing parts in your vision or tunnel vision is a, is a very clumsy thing to do because we know that you can lose vision and you don't really notice it. And also, I think it's particularly important for those patients who are kind of trying to adhere to treatment. They might look at these pictures and think, hang on, you know, that's not my form of glaucoma. You know, I haven't got the, the worst type, the advanced type. So maybe, you know, um, maybe my treatment it, it isn't, isn't so important. So, you know, I think um, it's very important that we kind of make sure that the public understands what glaucoma looks like. And um, this was a, a research paper we published a few years ago, and, it, and it's generated a lot of interest. And the actual experiment that we did was really simple. We just asked patients to describe their vision. So it'd be the same as if I was to turn around to you this afternoon and ask you to, to tell me what, what you actually see. So that's the first thing that we did. And then we showed these same participants in our study some pictures. We showed them this unmodified picture on the left here. And then we said, well, is, is this what you see of the world? Is, is it this kind of black tunnel? Or, or do you kind of perceive the world with this blur all around you, but still in a tunnel? Do you have these kind of stupid black patches in your uh, field of view? Or is it more about kind of blur and distortion? Or is it really more like this picture here? So in this picture, what we did is we used kind of Photoshop to take bits of the picture away. You know, in other words, you know, we, we've removed part of the car, we've removed some of the windows. So this is a very subtle kind of effect. And we know, and I'm sure many of the participants in this webinar this afternoon know, that this is really more akin to what the symptoms of glaucoma is like, that there are parts of your vision that are just simply missing. And um, so then we, we asked the patients, you know, which one of these pictures would you choose? So it's a very simple experiment. And, uh, you know, and unsurprisingly, no one talked about a black tunnel or black patches in their field of view. And most patients talked about distortions or blur or this kind of missing um, um, aspect to their vision. What was interesting is that one in four people with glaucoma with visual field loss in both eyes said they had no symptoms whatsoever. And this in itself is really interesting and again relates to this important point that I'm sure many of the participants of this webinar know this afternoon that, that glaucoma is asymptomatic. So unless you're diagnosed with it, you don't really know, certainly not in the early stages, with, with, whether you have the conditions. And when you ask patients to describe their vision loss, they're much more eloquent and much more articulate than, uh, than this idea of you know, tunnel vision or, or black patches in their field of view. You know, one lady said that uh, with quite advanced glaucoma, she said it's like looking through a pane of glass, like looking through a window that hasn't been cleaned properly. And I thought that was a really sort of eloquent, eloquent way of describing what this visual disturbance that she has, that she, she, she lives with. And these were some of the words that were used. And again, hopefully some of these um, uh, words will resonate with this audience because these are the kind of things that patients talked about, the problems and difficulties that they had with. Often things about mobility, uh, walking around, stairs. And, and this is something that's you know, really quite important for anybody who has visual field loss about this this awareness of your visual field loss and how it might impact on your mobility. Philippa, I hope we still have time for the modeling bit. Are we, are we okay for the, uh, for the final part? Yeah, we're absolutely fine, David. Please carry on. Good. So this is the Kate Moss bit, really. <laughs> and uh, so there she is, that's Kate Moss uh, in her prime about 15 years ago. Here's another model. Uh, you, you wouldn't think, Philippa, I know all this stuff, but this is, um, this is Carleen Kloss. She was one of the most well-paid uh, models uh, in the world, I think in 2018, front page of Vogue. Uh, you probably know who that is, Philippa. That's uh, David Beckham. Oh, yes. He did a, yeah, he did, he, he did some modelling in his time. And this guy here, he's called Cameron Dallas, and he was one of the youngest um, international male models of the year in 2017. Very young, but you have to say a very handsome young man. So that's models. But unfortunately, that's not the modeling I'm going to be talking about briefly at the end of this talk. The modeling I'm going to be talking about is um, the kind of modeling that we do as scientists when we try to predict or forecast what's happening. Now, many of you, you know, whenever you turn on the news at the moment, will probably be kind of almost fed up with the kind of modeling and predictions and forecasts that we have about the pandemic. So in the last year or so, we've, we've had lots of examples of where people are trying to predict and model 
what might be happening uh, with the pandemic, for example. And I can guarantee that all of you, all of the participants this afternoon, have used some kind of model already today. You, you may not have known it, but you've, I can guarantee that you've all kind of used some kind of modeling uh, and you don't know it. And one of those is, is this, because every day, you know, you have these people, uh, the weather forecasters and the meteorologists who are trying to predict what's happening with the weather. And um, uh, if I put that picture in front of uh, young people, they wouldn't really understand what I'm going to say now. But um, hopefully for, for some of you, this will resonate. You know, sometimes these predictions can go badly wrong. The models can be really wrong. And this is, um, this is um, uh, a very famous example of a, a guy called Michael Fish who predicted the weather to be you know, very pleasant. And then the next day we woke up to the worst storms seen in the UK for 100 years. Now, the reason I'm, I'm going on about this modeling is this is something, Philippa, that we've done a lot of in our, in our lab. And, and, and before your audience falls asleep, the reason I'm going to show you this is because if I was a glaucoma patient, I'd want to know the results of some of this modeling. And it's actually quite, um, quite um, gives an optimistic view about people's, um, about people's glaucoma. So, so hang in there while I try to explain what I'm, uh, what, what I'm talking about here. So in this modeling, we've, we've done lots of work and we know that we're living in a, in a, uh, in a, in a population where the, the demographic is changing, which is just a sophisticated posh way of saying that, you know, we're living in a, in a, a population where we're getting more and more elderly people. This is some work that we've done. We've shown that there's a million hospital visits every year of glaucoma. You know, so this is a huge kind of um, burden on, on the NHS, really. And, um, you know, this is, this is sometimes, I'm sure, when you've had to go to your hospital for your appointment, this is sometimes what it feels like, I would imagine, you know, going to a glaucoma clinic. You know, there, there's lots of people and it's very busy. And we've been um, doing quite a bit of work in this area, but I, I just wanted to uh, um, highlight this piece of work that we did this uh, this, for this webinar this afternoon. And in this modeling work, what we showed is that actually most people, many like, of your say participants in this webinar this afternoon, most people who've got a diagnosis of glaucoma, most people who are being cared for in hospital clinics are not going to lose vision in their lifetime. And uh, the results of our model kind of show this. And the way we did this is by using literally thousands, hundreds of thousands of patient records from hospitals all over England. And when you have data like this, you can start to do some sort of interesting things. So um, remember earlier, I told you about these uh, visual field charts. These are the visual field charts from just sort of one person, one person's eye. And you can see that this, this dark area in the visual field seems to be getting worse over time. We can plot this on a graph. Over here on this part of the graph is um, the severity of the visual field. So in other words, um, you know, uh, the more negative the number, then the worse the visual field. So we can see that the person's vision is deteriorating over time. And then we can kind of fit a line or put a line through these points and say, right, you know, this patient's vision is deteriorating. And then we can go back into our kind of database of all the patients in all of these hospitals. Remember, we've got hundreds of thousands of these, Philippa. And then we can start plotting some more. So these are some younger patients over here. Notice it's a bit weird because some of the, some of the plots seem to be going up, which is sort of suggesting that their vision is getting better. You know, you've got this person over here where they seem to be losing vision very rapidly, but you know, they're, they're already, you know, 93, 94 years of age. You can keep adding to this graph and you end up with like a stupid, uh, hairy uh, graph like this. And the reason I show you this kind of stupid, hairy graph is to say that there's enormous variability. In other words, you know, every patient is very different in terms of the way they react to, to treatment and how they, they, they may or may not lose vision. And the modeling part is that if you take a patient um, such as this, we can actually call a, kind of predict or kind of work out the number of years uh, that they have in terms of their residual lifetime. Um, participants in the webinar this afternoon, I'm sure, have all got life insurance. And the way that life insurance works is that the life insurance people kind of work out, you know, they use this thing called actuarials um, uh, calculations to kind of predict the likelihood of how many years you have, uh, you know, remaining as it were which is a bit depressing to think about but anyway for this particular patient we predicted that this patient has 15 years roughly of, of life remaining 
And then we make another leap of faith and we say, well, if the vision continues to deteriorate in this fashion, then in that particular eye, the patient may have visual impairment. When we look at the patient's other eye, it's much more stable under treatment. And I would argue that this patient's uh, treatment is being effective. And, you know, in their remaining life years, their vision is going to be fine, certainly fine and well enough uh, for driving, for example. And so we put all this modeling results into this graph. Now, this, this graph on the face of it might, might look a little bit complicated, but it's actually got a very important message uh, for, the, for the participants, hopefully, of this uh, webinar. Now, to understand my graph is that everyone, every dot in this graph, every, every single um, um, kind of symbol in this graph represents a person in a clinic. And if their right, if their left eye is deteriorating, if their left eye, if their visual field loss in their left eye is worsening, or their vision is deteriorating in their left eye, then they would go in that direction of the graph. If their right eye is deteriorating, if their right visual field is getting worse, then they would go in this direction. So to understand my graph, you know, where would you want, not want to be on this graph? If you were a person on this graph, if you had to think about it, you know, where would you not really want to be? Well, you don't want to be going down into that bottom right hand corner because that's, that means that's where your vision is going to be quite bad. So the next thing we do is we kind of add um, movement to this graph <laughs> and the movement represents time. And, um, you know, it's a bit kind of, uh, uh, well, uh, mesmerizing when you first look at this graph. So when you watch it again, what, what, what do we notice? So when it kicks off, you know, you've got all this movement, but then after about 15 years here, you'll notice that many of the dots have stopped moving. So what does that mean? Well, what that means uh, is that those, those are people who have actually reached their kind of end of life. That's their residual life expectancy. Uh, which is a bit depressing uh, on a Thursday afternoon, but it's a fact of life that many patients with visual field loss, you know, they're not going to lose vision in their remaining lifetime. Uh, then the next thing that's kind of a bit weird about this graph is all these green symbols, because they seem to be going in the opposite direction. They seem to be shooting off into the ce ceiling or into the wall over here. Well, these are people where they've got like a positive slope. Now that doesn't mean that by some miracle, their vision is getting better. But what it does mean is that they're quite variable and that, you know, that they are certainly stable. So their vision is not getting worse. So, you know, the, nearly half of our patients, you know, even though they're doing these regular visual field tests, you know, their vision is not getting worse during their lifetime. And by now you would have gathered that the, the people that uh, the ophthalmologists, the clinicians, the doctors are concerned about are these red dots, which are ending up in this bottom right-hand corner. But again, the, the kind of interesting finding from this research, and I guess if I was um, a patient or a person with glaucoma, or if I knew a person with glaucoma, this would be the thing that I think, well, this, 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 this sounds like a good result from this model, because what we predict is that for patients, once they're diagnosed in hospitals and under care, you know, there's only a very small chance that you're going to lose you know, kind of a lot of vision in your actual lifetime. Of course, it depends where we draw this line. We can also kind of think about the vision that you might lose uh, that means that you're no longer legally fit to drive, for example. But again, the, the probability that you're going to lose your driving license in your lifetime is quite small. You know, it's about 12%. Uh, in other words, you know, around about nine, eight out of 10 people are, are really not going to be at risk of even losing vision so that it stops them from driving for the rest of their life. So I think that this, this kind of modeling or th this model, which isn't really as exciting as some of the other models that I talked about at the beginning of the, uh, the talk, uh, it actually holds a very key um, message, um, certainly for patients and the families of patients. And that is that once you're diagnosed, um, you know, your likelihood of losing vision in your lifetime is quite small. And one other thing, Philippa, I'll just point out to kind of reassure your, uh, your audience as well, is, is look where these red dots have come from on the graph. If you look very closely, you'll notice that none of the red dots have come from this top left-hand corner. And again, this re reiterates a very important point that glaucoma is all about the diagnosis. So in other words, you know, if you get your diagnosis early and you are under the care of an ophthalmologist or a doctor and you're being treated for your intraocular pressure, 
then your likelihood of, of being one of these red dots is, is much smaller. In other words, you know, the patients that are more at risk are those that come into the health service or start to get treated you know, very late in the course of their disease. So again, you know, hopefully for many of the patients that are listening this afternoon, you know, you've already got your diagnosis of glaucoma, you're already being successfully treated. So you're less likely to be one of these kind of red dots in my um, kind of stupid graph. The last thing I'm going to uh, say to you, Philippa, is, um, is, is, uh, is something that uh, is free and available, which is always nice. And that is, uh, this is a, an app that we've developed for um, an iPad or iPhone or Android device. Um, it's actually been developed in conjunction with UK Glaucoma. It's a, uh, an app to kind of explain some of the things I've been talking about this afternoon, uh, waffling on about this afternoon, this idea about visual field loss and how it impacts on vision and, and what it looks like. So if any of your audience is interested in that, then uh, and they have an iPad or an iPhone or an Android device, then they can have a look at it. It's called Glaucoma in Perspective. And as I say, it's completely free and um, we'd be interested to see what you think of it. I realize I really have run over time here. This is um, some of the people in my research lab. I'd also like to point out Glaucoma UK, not only do they really work very well with um, patients and the families of patients, but they also support research. So people like me are very grateful that UK Glaucoma have supported my research lab with funding over the years, along with another charity called Fight for Sight. These people punch well above their weight in the way in which they support research in the UK. So uh, Philippa, I, I feel as I've really waffled on too long there, but um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you. David, thank you so, so much. And please don't apologise for waffling because it just means that people have to hear me waffling instead. Um, I do need to raise a very important point with you right at this point, though. I do believe the model you showed in the first picture isn't Kate Moss, but actually is Jodie Kidd. Really? I know. Well, that, I'm sorry. Uh, Maybe I should have no, saved that for later, but I just feel now that, you know, I was checking my eyesight. I was uh, like, is, no, is it me? No, that, that's really good. And it wasn't a trick question. Uh, she, she's been <laughs> in that slide for many years. So now I know it's Jodie and not uh, Kate. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. But I'll find you a picture of Kate Moss. We can put that in. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. Um, Brilliant. Thank you, David. Thank you so, so much for that. And thank you for your kind words um, about, about us as well. That's really appreciated. Um, one of the things I love about your work is it's how you guys translate data into how it affects people in their day-to-day -day life. And that's something I think that you and I and, and all of Glaucoma UK share really in our, in our philosophy of trying to um, get that information out to people and, and empower them, you know, to understand their condition as well. And, um, you know, how, what, how, what's exactly happening to their eyes and, you know, the, the differences that, that treatments can make and stuff. So I've got a few questions, David. I'm going to fire these at you if that's OK. Sure, of course. Please do. Excellent. OK, so the first one is... Um, Okay, it was about the importance of the whole glaucoma picture and um, how you were talking about the fact that you can't judge the, the visual uh, disability just by looking at one eye. Of course, you kind of need to look at them both together. And the fact that also you said the location of, the, um, of where the sight loss is is very, very important as well. And I had a question really about where that loss is. I mean, is it just luck where that loss appears in your eye or the different glaucomas kind of affect where that loss might be in the eye? I, I, you know, uh, typically in these sessions, that's a really, really good question, Philippa. Whoever asked that question is a great question. And the reason I, I talk about this to, to an audience such as this is to encourage people to find out more about where their visual field loss is. Because I think, again, coming back to that study that we did where we asked people about visual field loss and perimetry and what they liked and didn't like about their visits to the hospital, it, it, it amazed me how few people actually even looked at their visual field charts. So the first thing I would say is encourage uh, patients who are listening to this afternoon or family members of patients to, 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 to find out more about your visual field loss. And that's where the app is quite useful because it will tell you a little bit more. Your question about, you know, where it comes, is it, is it like, well, no, it comes in certain patterns in glaucoma. And um, we know for certain that superior visual field loss, and again, that's an awfully posh word for saying that visual field loss here is kind of more common. And uh, that's not a bad thing, really, because what we've also done, and uh, I won't go into too much detail, is we've done a lot of research to say that visual field loss in the inferior visual field down here is going to be more uh, kind of disabling. So I would just encourage um, you know, your, your audience to find out more about their visual field results, really. That's excellent. Thank you. That's wonderful. Um, I've got another one here. It's about research in your labs. Looks like a lot of fun. Um, how do <laughs> how do you 
pick your research participants to get involved in in the research i mean how do you select people how do they where do they appear well, that, that's another really excellent question so um I, I, there, there's another study that we've done recently where we've um we've got people to take home like a, a visual field test to home <laughs> and you know they can actually take it home and test themselves and and the people the participants from that study for, were from glaucoma uk so every now and again if you've got members uh who uh, you know have your excellent publication? You'll see like little adverts where we encourage people to come and do our studies. So if there's anybody out there who wants to volunteer, then please get in touch. I should have mentioned at the end with this slide here. You know we're we're on Twitter and you can find us on the web. And if anyone wants to volunteer and come along and do some studies and you know have a have some biscuits and a cup of tea at the, the university, then they're, they're more than welcome. That's fantastic. And I think as well on the Glacova UK website under our research section, uh, you can pop into there and we put up research opportunities uh, uh, for people there. And it also tells you a bit more about how you can get involved, which websites are there as well. So if it's something you're interested in, guys, Brilliant. definitely worth a, a look there. And um, we've got some kind of uh, I've got a wider question on research, which you may or may not know. I'm not sure if this is anything your lab has got to, um, has got research interest in. But someone here particularly interested in, in glaucoma and type four diabetes. Um, and just wondering about how they would find out what kind of research is happening in that area. Right. So, um, as I said, you know, I, I'm not a clinician, but over the years, I, I've obviously learned a lot of clinical stuff. I've not really heard of type four diabetes before. Um, if, if you're if someone's asking a question about diabetes, then I think, um, you know, I, I, there are links between diabetes and certain types of glaucoma. Diabetes mm. isn't necessarily a risk factor for glaucoma, but anyone with diabetes, of course, um, you know, has to have a very, um, you know, has to think very carefully about having regular checks with their eyes. So um, that, that's all I could probably say on that question. Really. Absolutely. And just to really to, to, to say to anyone that's got diabetes, that they'll have their diabetic eye check as one thing, but you, it doesn't substitute for having your other eye check as well. So just because no. you're having your diabetic one, you also need your other one. Um, Good point. That's a really interesting question. Um, mm. And it's probably um, worth us having a look and to see if there's any uh, research into that. So um, we, we will have a look for you and see if we can see if there's anything ongoing or any leads that we can give that, that person that asked that question. Yeah, yeah please um, do. If it, yeah. And I should have said, Philippa, you know, if anyone's got any questions afterwards, because, you know, it, they might not have been, you know, they can always email me or send, send uh, something directly to us. That's wonderful, David. Thank you for that. You don't know what you left yourself in for, you know, that's what, that's what happens. Um, I've got someone here who has asked a very interesting question. I think a lot of it tunes into what you were talking about in the later part. Um, this person says, I'm 49 and already have a lot of sight loss in my left eye. Does that mean I'm one of those who's going to lose sight? Well, again, uh, you know, 49 is, is very, very young. <laughs> that's the third thing I would say, which is, is good. But um, I, I think even even if someone's lost a lot of vision in one eye, then, um, you know, the, the preservation of vision in the in the better seeing eye is so important. And uh, again, the only thing I would say is that you must really kind of adhere and follow exactly what your ophthalmologist consultant is saying. Now, what we find is that the people who are really at risk of vision, uh, Philip, uh, vision loss in their lifetime, is where they've lost lots of vision in both eyes mm -hmm. before they've had a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that will be a, um, a, a you know somewhat reassuring. But the, the key to all of these things is, of course, adhering to your treatment and following Absolutely. what your um, your um, caring ophthalmologist has, uh, you know, in terms of looking after you really. Absolutely. And if that person has any concerns about what's happening, you know, please do call the helpline or, mm. or give us an email if you're concerned and hopefully we'll be able to to help you out there. And um, I've got uh, just two more questions. I think that's all we'll be able to fit in um, for today. But the first one is quite interesting. Um, is there a simple way to judge sight at home? And the reason I thought this was quite <laughs> interesting was because we're talking about the day to day, you know, that, that day to day activities and how they're um, but I wish there was a, 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 an easy way to do it. That would be great, wouldn't it? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, uh, community optometrists who we train uh, encourage people to do this kind of simple thing, and that is to cover, you know, one eye and sort of look at a certain part of the room. Like I've got like a pretty crazy <laughs> wallpaper here. And, and if you cover one eye and, and kind of look at, um, um, uh, you know, like a, a maybe your favourite picture or, you know, part of a, a part of your wallpaper or something, then you know you you should in a way be able to see whether you've got like a kind of any kind of distortion or any kind of uh, problem with your eyes. It's something that we just don't do, and we you know we don't encourage people to do. 
the, the thing with glaucoma, Philippa, what you know and what all your audience members know is that the only way in which you can really tell if you've got this kind of, you know, awfully nuisance kind of condition is to have like this proper eye, eye um, uh, examination, really. So, um, uh, but we are doing some work at the moment where we're thinking about how can we kind of monitor vision loss in patients at home. And again, if you have a look on the web, you'll, you'll find some of the work that we've done in that area as well. Absolutely. That's definitely an up and coming area, isn't it? Uh, allowing mm. people to do more of this stuff at home so people don't have to exactly. keep going in. And the yeah. final question I'm going to just have here is um, when you were talking about, and we were both talking about actually the importance of people understanding their own condition. Um, and someone's put here, how do I get someone to explain my field charts to me? I suspect the doctors in the clinic won't have much time to do this. Which... <laughs> Such a good question, and, 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 I'm, and I'm really grateful for the question because I think, if anything, I know I've probably waffled on a lot, a lot about our research, but the one key message for your patients that are listening is to really find out more about your visual field um, uh, chart. And as I say, the, you know, the best thing is to maybe um, uh, go back and, um, you know, ha have a look at this glaucoma in perspective app, or, you know, if you haven't got an iPad or a phone, maybe get your son or your daughter or, you know, someone that you know. Because within this, it's not just like a, a patient leaflet. There's like an explanation about how the visual field works and you can actually do a demonstration and you can actually start drawing on it. So that might be a good starting point, but I would encourage your, um, you know, the, the patient who asked that nice question to, you know, to, to really ask the ophthalmologist, can I have a look at my visual field charts? I'm curious to know. Absolutely right. And, you know, ask, we, we I would encourage people to ask the questions and if it's difficult on, on the time, write them down before you go in. So you've got them there in front of you and think to yourself, I'm not leaving until I've got this information. Um, and as I said, if you're having problems in, uh, with these kind of things or with confidence, please, as I said, call us again. And, you know, hopefully we'll be able to, to help you and give some, some tips and tools for, for making you feel more confident about that. Absolutely. I, I, I think it's, it's the same about intraocular pressure as well. You know, what we found is patients, you know, kind of obsess about their intraocular pressure and they say, you know, uh, it was 26 and, you know, this time it's 25. You know, these numbers... You know, there's so much variability in them mm -hmm. that, that uh, you know, it's not really as clear cut that, you know, that, that there's a difference between the values. So I would, again, I would encourage you to find out more about these uh, uh, examinations and, you know, the doctor is probing and pressing you and asking you to press the buttons. You know, you've been examined. So try and find out what your results are. That's what I would encourage you to do. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and we've got lots of leaflets that we're now um, rewriting to make them more plain English, basically, and make them more understandable uh, about the tests and why they do the tests. Um, but absolutely right. You know, as a patient, you have a right to be able to ask as well, why am I doing this? What will this tell us? Can I see this, please? Um, mm. And we should, you know, I know that people are short of time, but it's very important that people, you know, feel confident they understand their condition. Right. Thank and you that... so much. I, I'm so sorry. I'm going to have to just you know, we're enjoying this so much. We're seven minutes past, but I must put up my last slide, Sorry. David. Yeah. No, you're yeah, okay. Course. I'm just going to stop you sharing for a second. No um, problem. And I'm going to put up my one here. So I told everybody that I'm extremely strict, you see, with my time. I'm terrible. Um, right, wait a second, guys. I'm just going to uh, play my, my last slide. Um, Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, just to let you know that my very shiny kind of uh, uh, Zoom background here is because it's uh, Glaucoma Awareness Week at the end of June, uh, from the 28th of June to the 4th of July. And Glaucoma UK have got lots of exciting activities uh, going to be happening. And there's lots of ways that you can kind of show your support for us. So please have a look at our website and see if you can get involved with us there. Um, the theme this year is Glaucoma and Families. And we're looking for, we're looking at that particular issue in terms of how to have conversations with your family if you have glaucoma or we're also looking at pe uh, supporting people who care for people with glaucoma over this week and um, so lots of exciting things to do um, thank you i'm not going to keep you in all that thank you so much for joining this this webinar helpline uh, uh telephone number and um email addresses on the screen we're open monday to friday 9 30 to 5 um, as part of Glaucoma Awareness Week, we'll be running a webinar on childhood glaucomas, a, pa a parent's guide. Um, that's on the 29th of June at 7 p.m. And you can sign up for that on our website. And um, if you have any questions uh, about glaucoma, please, please uh, get in contact. Um, this will be the last talk that we do before our summer break, uh, before and then we come back in September with a new exciting range of, of talks to keep us going. I'm just going to quickly going to launch my second poll. This is the one that tells me if you uh, feel like you're learning uh, from these things. So I'm going to launch that now. And if you can just let me know um, how you feel at the 
at the end of that and I'll see your results popping in. It's lovely, I can see it all happening now. Um, there'll also be a survey monkey that we'll send out to everyone partaking today that really lets us know what we're doing right, what you want to know more of, and it gives you a uh, space to tell us what you'd like us to, to talk about. So we'd love to hear your views there. Um, so it just leaves me to say, um, David, thank you. Thank you so much for giving up your time today uh, to talk to us. No, That's thank you. Amazing talk. Thank you so much. Um, everybody have a wonderful weekend when it comes. Thanks again for joining us. Hope to see you soon. Bye bye now.